welcome to another episode of our series talking about handmade, historical handmade and how it changed up until today. We'll be talking about another handmade technique that you can meet in Poland. Enjoy! Welcome to another episode of our series about handmade made in Poland, but how it used to be and how it is today. <laughs> today I've got a story of pająki, literally speaking, like translating literally, that's spiders. But don't be afraid, <laughs> that's not about those insects that many of us are afraid of. Pająki is a type of decoration. And the story of Pająki will be introduced by Karolina Nowaczek and Mrs. Małgorzata Bołka from Szubin in a translated conversation. If you want to go to the original, then just jump into previous episodes of this podcast. And now let's dig into the translation. Obviously, Małgorzata Bołka, who comes from Szubin, was involved in the folk art of Pałki. Her mother used to be involved as well, so so to say that's a family tradition, especially in ornamentation, and she kind of got it from her, as she admits. Currently she's running a handicraft circle in community center, and she has a status of folk artist in the field of ornamentation and folk rituals of Pauki region. But what exactly Payonki are? <laughs> Literally translating, those are spiders. But I guess it's more of describing what it is that will tell you the story. Those are nothing more than traditional decorations made from rice straw and tissue paper. Those rice straws are used because they are strongest. The strongest, you know, of corns. People used to use newspapers for decorations and then when tissue paper became available, they started using it instead. So payonki were hung under the ceilings in cottages and they were made especially for Christmas. Once during the Christmas period contests used to be organized for the best payonki decorations. Now we're in this um, payonki making for pauki folk art contests as um, Małgorzata admitted, which takes place in the community center in Szubin at the regional museum in Fongrowiec. That's where this interview was held. And as she admits, uh, she's making those pająki out of straw and tissue paper. There are various types of pająki of those decorations, such as bells, spheres, stars, even pyramids or ovals. <laughs> so... That's a quite a good story about Pająki. But how about the symbolism? Did they symbolize anything? Why were they made for Christmas, right? <laughs> Are they somehow connected to Christmas symbolism or this period of the year? As Malgorata mentioned, they were just used as a decoration. The smaller ones were hung in the Christmas tree. In the old cottages, there were furnaces where, where you know, furnaces were used for heating Payonki were hung to hide the black, chattered places before the cottage was whitewashed. So, are there specific colors to be used on a payonk, so-called payonk? Or is it just the artist's choice? <laughs> well, any colors could be used. Today, we have up to 20 shades of a single tissue paper color, so it's completely the artist's choice. We don't dictate anything. <laughs> so, and how long does it take to make such a payong? So, as Mrs. Małgorzata admitted, kids and teenagers make payonki during uh, those classes of around two hours a week. They usually start after Christmas and end around March or April. And they have a break before Easter for making Easter decorations because it usually takes two or three months. She admitted they need less time when she makes payonki at home, but two weeks minimum, and it depends on the type of the payonk. For the bell, for example, she makes each ball that consists of 30 flakes that needs to be curled separately, and each chain is twinned with a straw and three tissue flakes, and each flake has to be curled separately. So as you can imagine, that takes a lot of time. 
So two weeks per hour a day, something more or less like that. As Mrs. Malgojata admitted, it's usually the evenings where longer, where like longer evenings or sometimes during Saturdays is where she works. First, she has to cut out all the circles and then cut it in right places and start curling. Then the flakes are curled, like when are they all curled? She starts completing the chains and so, for example, the bell payong uh, has 20 chains with 10 bigger spheres and 10 smaller ones. And that's what she needs to, you know, create those two wheels for, just to fix those chains. So that seems that it's quite complicated, but it, it's only what it seems. And how about, you know, how to take those payonki somewhere else? Is it easy to transport them? It seems they are quite fragile. Well, as Mrs. Margojata admitted, the bell payong is easy to transport because one can fold one circle on top of the other and the chains just stretched. But those pyramid ones or spheres or stars are way more difficult to transport because they cannot be folded like that. Okay, so as Mrs. Malgorzata mentioned, children are learning how to create such payonki, and uh, she just runs classes. But are there any adults interested in this subject who would like to take up and, you know, become folk artists in the future? Well, she admitted that there are two ladies in her class who are over 18 years old, and they are in the adult group, so to say. And she assumes that one of them could handle Payonki herself. So <laughs> for us, it's only a way to be happy about people who are interested in the art. And this art will not disappear because we will have somebody to pass it on to the next generation. As Mrs. Maugorzata admitted, she even has one male student. He has been attending classes for over five years. They had a rule that each year they make a different payong and the students choose what they would like to make. And she doesn't impose anything. So she prepares the straw and the uh, measures and they try to cut it themselves. She prepares the circles for the flowers uh, herself, to save the material, and the rest is just up to the participants of the workshop. And as it was admitted during the interview, uh, those participants of the workshops, they also are competing in the contest. And this year, as Mrs. Magojata mentioned, all those who had Payonki won an award. So one was awarded an honorable mention, even one of those people. So they got equivalent rewards because the jury found that Payonki are on an equal level. So they were all very pretty. So that says something about the person who leads those workshops, right? So how about those roads and asparagus? That's something maybe to talk about. So the roads, as Ms. Magujata mentioned, were made as painting decorations. Paintings were hung diagonally on the walls. And that's why people used to put the rods behind them delicately. Rods were also put in the corners where people had the figurines of saints, of the Virgin Mary, for example, or a cross. So people used to put rods, flower bouquets or reds there. Reds were also hung on paintings to decorate them. They weren't like the reds girls wore on their heads. The dancing girls had reds called usemki, like literally translating that's like eight, like eight chefs. Because once most of the girls had braids, braided in the eight, and on them they put the rats, hence the name, right? So like the plots were in this eight shape and then the rat on the head. The pauki asparagus were made for Easter and they were regional poems. To make an aspargel, you need a reed, crab cornets and herbs, sand joints work or straw flower or yellow, tansy, and, you know, you just twine them all together. Each layer is twined with moss, and in the end, you add the cornets. So the asparagus were used for the blessing of the Easter foods and were hung on the doors. 
Legend has it that if a bachelor didn't want to propose to a girl for too long and was led through the door with an asparagus, it meant that he was not allowed to come there anymore and that he had no chances. You know, the next type of decoration is the harvest bouquet. It was made after the harvest back when the wheat was in beans. Today, we have to cut the wheat before the combines to get the, you know, ears of wheat. We decorate the ears with tissue cut like the ornaments for payonki. And we cut the circles, curl them into seven flakes. Then we just cut the stars, finished with a kind of a green flag, glued, so it's kind of called the leaf. And another decoration that uh, Mrs. Nogojata mentioned, there were also harvest braids. To make those, you need to just cook the straw. Back then, you only had to soak the straw in hot water because the wheat was different. Then it was braided. Boiled, wet straw is soft and you can bend it easily. The braids had different shapes. Once they were dry, they were shaped into different shapes, leaves, spirals, and decorated with tissue paper. They were usually made by young girls for their betrothed, their, to decorate their hats, right? And now they are made for the best men and put their buttonholes during the <laughs> harvest festival. So as you see, those, those decorations, it's just like a new chapter of a whole new story. So the material you use is right. Has there ever been a year that, you know, there was a problem with getting it? That was a question that Carolina asked to Mrs. Mogojata. And she said that if there wasn't right, she used triticle. You can also use oats to make the bouquet. And each grain is tucked in foil. And this year round, <laughs> Jock, is there a time during the year when, you know, there's something else to be done? You know, we can actually assume that if there's no rye, there's no corn, there's something else to be done. And Mrs. Malgojata just mentioned that she needs to prepare the wheat before the harvest. She needs to dry it well and keep it in a dry place so it doesn't get moldy. She usually prepares straw, cuts it and hangs it upside down for the ears to be straight for the harvest bouquets, which she makes the next year. So there's always something to be done with the you know, rice, with the corn. And is the pyramid payong's pattern always traditional and the same? Because, you know, Carolina admitted that she can see three different ones there at the place where they were holding this interview. And she was just asking to Mrs. Malgojata, does she make any changes from, you know, time to time just to make something different each year, for example? And Mrs. Malgojata admitted that Sometimes she changes the size or the color. Sometimes the corners of the pyramid are of different colors or sometimes each element has a different color. And uh, when asked about some kind of memorable payong, uh, you know, special one or a custom made, she told the story about this round one for a lady who chose the colors and used it as a chandelier. Very modern way of using it, actually. The bell can also be used as a chandelier. Just put a light bulb inside and there you have it. <laughs> so for me as an you know interior designer specializing in handmade <laughs> interior design, that's something to explore, definitely. And when asked about, you know, payonki in those bell shapes, she said that those come in two types. One is made of chains or spheres and the chains are twined with three round pieces of tissue and... The other one is made of chains made of stars, also twined with straw stars. And instead of small spheres, there are pyramid baskets and the, at the center. And in a way, in the heart of the bell, it's just a straw star. <laughs> I know it could be hard to imagine when I'm just telling you this story in this audio form. But please do have a look at the website of the project. There you can find some photos. And they are definitely worth taking a glance on. And how about, you know, the spooky folk art contest that we mentioned at the beginning? For Mrs. Malgojata, for 58 years, she has been or, uh, like organizing the spooky folk art contest. 
as she mentioned, it has been organized, right? Not in a way that she organized it. But the disciplines are many. They're like sculpture, ornamentation, embroidery addressed to folk artists, you know, and this whole contest is addressed to artists, amateurs, children, and even for teenagers. So folk artists are people with official folk artist status given by the Association of Folk Artists in Lublin, General Board, right? And that is where the committee of the Polish ethnographers gather and they decide whether the artist's works are good enough to grant them the status of a folk artist. If not, the artist has to work on their skills and apply again. And we know that Mrs. Malgorzata, who was interviewed here, has this, you know, folk artist status. And she has it since 2005. There is a rule that you have to take part in the contest at least five years in a row, and then you can apply to join the Association of Folk Artists and then receive the folk artist status. For this contest, she got the works from the Pauki regions because it's mainly about the folk art of Pauki. And she admitted they have works from Żnin, Ksenia, Wągrowiec, Rogowo, and from Szubin as well. And there were also Wabishin and Barcin, but now there isn't anyone there. This year, uh, mainly 2020, <laughs> they had 333 works sent from for the contest by 67 artists, 25 of whom are children and teenagers, and the rest were adults. So that's something warm-hearted, right, about the handmade. And when doing this interview, they both were placed in the room where all the, you know, awarded works were displayed. And about this place, there also has been a publication for this, you know, 45th uh, contest. Um, and Carolina asked for that. And about the publication that contained biographies of all the artists who had participated in the contest by, by the time of publication, um, both living and dead, there were photos, notes, tables that showed all the people that you now ever took part in the contest and the whole history of the contest since 1963. And Mrs. Małgorzata <laughs> admitted that she hopes to make a new brochure for the 60th contest and there will be a lot of workshops and events linked to this anniversary. So that's something worth to observe and to consider. So if you want to just, you know, try out how to make a traditional payong or any other traditional Pauki region decorations and maybe try some of this handmade for your own, that's worth to observe. So I invite you to the website of this project to get some more info. And I hope that I invited you to this colorful world of traditional handmade. I hope I see you in the next episode.